It's election 2023, and I'm very pleased to be joined in studio by leader of the National Party, Christopher Luxon. Hello. Hello. Good to be with you. Thank you for making the time. I understand uh, a Rima fan from way back in the day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was actually what our family listened to all through through the 80s, I guess, is really what was on all our car radio stations into the 90s. And um, yeah, it's what we grew up with. Yeah. Well, look, I'm so glad you came in to have a bit of a chat with us today. And I'm, I'm really keen to explore, you know, your plan and your vision for New Zealand. And obviously, we've got some things that, um, you know, we yeah. need to talk about there. The thing I actually wanted to start with, though, is that, um, I mean, it's been, you know, quite the career transition for you. Just before we came on air, we were talking about your your world before yes. politics. I'm very interested to know, first and foremost, you're now a leader of the National Party. It's election season. You know, is it everything you hoped and dreamed it would be? Oh, I've absolutely loved it. The last two years has been fantastic. And I, I was fortunate that I'd had a good sort of up-close personal observation of both the key English government, but also Jacinda mm. Ardern's government as well. So I sort of knew what I was getting into. And frankly, it sort of you know has met my expectations. I don't feel like there's anything that surprised me too much. Interesting. Um, but it's been a very you know um, rapid rise and a rapid entry into politics. And you know we've, we've worked hard to turn the National Party around and then to hold the government to account and then hopefully give people a sense of what we want to do to, to get out of the mess that we're in at the moment. Did you feel in terms of the, even the way of communicating politically as well? I mean, um, look, this is not something unique to you, but I'm sure prior to all this, there's a filter that you need to sort of start to apply that, you know, the way you'd love yeah. to be able to talk maybe is not quite the same way because you know people are going to look to take their spin on things. Yeah, the, 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 the political press side of it is different from the commercial press, you know, from my old world. But, um, but again, you know, a lot of it is just trying to think through how you actually engage and get people to actually hear where you're coming from and get a sense of what you're about and, and what's driving you. Yeah. Um, but look, a lot of it's very, very similar in terms of a lot of the leadership challenges is actually is very much the same. How do you get a team that was dysfunctional mm. actually playing together well, properly formed as a team, get the right people in the right places, um, build the right culture uh, with the staff and with the MPs? Um, and then focus on on what we should be focusing on, which is playing our role in democracy and being the opposition. But also, I've been a big believer of let's oppose, but also let's propose mm. ideas as well. And um, and that's been fun working up, you know, what what practically, in a common sense way, would actually take the country forward. So um, so no, so it's been it's been a great transition and one that I've thoroughly loved and, and enjoyed. And it's just a huge privilege and, and a great responsibility to do the job, but um, huge privilege to do it. And so tell me then about what skills do you think really translated across well? I mean, you mentioned in terms of leadership and putting a team together. I mean, it'd probably be fair to say you had quite the challenge uh, yeah, stepping yeah. into the role <laughs> yeah. to do all that. But um, I mean, what things in particular, maybe there were stuff that you did, uh, you know, say within in New well, Zealand I, or other roles that yeah. translated across? Well, I think, you know, when you see great organisations, whether they're community organisations, whether they're businesses or whether, you know, even political organisations, um, that's actually not about taking business principles into the, to the political world. It's actually mm. about just the principles of good leadership and good organisations, because uh, there's a lot of bad businesses, you, know, you just wouldn't want any of that practice in, in political life either. So for me, um, a lot of it has been sort of what's the vision, you know, how do you actually get the best out of people, put the right people in the right seats in the right place? How do you make sure that you actually solve problems? You know, I spent a lot of my life doing that, uh, turning things around, um, working with, through and for people. And, and in, in essence, you know, that's been what this job's about as well. And that's what the challenge is for the country, I think, ultimately, is that, yes, I'm not a 20-year career politician. Mm. I actually think that's a good thing because mm. you come to the job with real world experience and a, and a different perspective, an outside perspective. Um, and the country's in a place where it actually needs someone who understands the economy well, and not just the dollars and the cents and the economics and all that dry stuff, but actually understands that the economy is actually what is, when it works well and it's well managed, you know, it does, it, you, you avoid the economic pain and suffering that people are experiencing right now, I believe, because there's been such a, a huge amount of economic mismanagement going on in the country. Because that, things... that, that economy then enables people to get ahead, but it also enables us to invest in the public services, mm. like better health and education that we desperately want to get as well. Yeah, because those things are sometimes set as almost like an opposition to one another, right? That, uh, you know, you can be for the economy or you can be for public services and... Oh, they're completely linked. That's the thing, right? I mean, you just cannot have a higher, you know, a world-class education system or, or all the aspiration we want to have in healthcare if you don't have the economic foundation to be able to deliver it. And mm. so the reason we want to have a strong economy is to, to lift wages and incomes for all New Zealanders so they've got more freedom and choice as to how they get to live their life. Mm. But it's also the way we get to afford better public services and the infrastructure we need to build and all those other things as well. So 
it's not the money or the, the the economy for the economy's sake. It's actually what it enables us to do is, is actually what it's really about. And what do you think has been missing from the approach that, uh, say, the government's taken over the last, say, six years? It's yeah, look, I think there's that. three things. One is there's been a huge amount of economic mismanagement. It's a government that's spent more. The government spending's up a billion dollars a week, up over eighty percent, and yet we haven't seen an eighty percent improvement in education or health mm. or crime or anything. It's taxed more. Uh, it's taking a hundred million dollars a day extra in tax uh, from New Zealanders, and sadly, it's borrowed more. It's gone from five billion of debt to seventy-three billion dollars of debt that our kids will end up paying off, and when that limits the choices that they get to have in the future in New Zealand as well. So that whole the, the the economic policies have then created inflation. That's led to high interest rates. That's now led to New Zealand being the only country in the Asia Pacific region in a recession. And that comes with it a risk of rising unemployment, and that's just the history of economics. But their mm. policies have con- have made that happen, and as a result, that's causing huge pain and suffering for Kiwis. You know, one in two of us are now worried about money on a daily basis. There's 430,000 Kiwis behind on their debt. Um, you know, there's families that I've met that are in food food banks that you know, have good jobs and average incomes that are there in record numbers, and so it's that's the consequence of economic mismanagement. I think the second big challenge is there's been a big centralisation and control drive. Mm. And we as a party believe in what we call localism and devolution. Those closest to the problem in the community should solve the problem um, versus believing that the right answer is to build bureaucracy in Wellington. And so whether that's been the polytechnics, whether it's been the, the DHBs, whether it's been the three water assets, building them into big mega bureaucracies. And that's just led to you know 15,000 more public servants in Wellington working often in the ministries rather than the front line as police officers or nurses or teachers or teacher aides. So, you know, that's been a challenge. Uh, And the third thing, I think, is there has been a huge amount of identity politics where groups of New Zealanders are pitched against other groups. And whether that's been farmers versus city folk or landlords versus tenants or um, employers versus employees, you know, there's been a huge amount of that. And I think we've got to say, look, we're really proud of all the um, diversity that exists in New Zealand, all the individual communities um, and experiences that we come from and identities that we have. But the thing that unites us is that we're all Kiwis. And so we've got to work harder at uniting the place rather than having division. Mm, okay, well, let's let's unpack some of those then, because I mean, in terms of your overall three-part plan, I know there's more to the plan than that, but the, the three big things you've talked about primarily, number one is rebuilding the economy. So we'll, we'll talk about some more about that in a moment. Yep. Also, the restoring of law and order and improving, improving schools and, and healthcare. And I suppose, as you've mentioned, things like schools and healthcare are somewhat connected to the economic solutions and, yep. and those sorts of things then. Um, why don't we talk about the, the identity politics thing? Because I feel like that is something that has gained a lot more ground in the last little while. And it, it seems to be uh, even one of those topics that's very hard to address without being pigeonholed one way or the other. You yeah. know, you, you're, you're for these people, you're against these people. If you say this, then you hate these guys yeah. or, or whatever it might be. Uh, what is the approach to this then? I mean, it, you know, it'd be fair to say if I'm playing, ironically, being at Rima Devil's Advocate, uh, but, yeah. you know, that there are certain groups of people who are disadvantaged. And is it really unfair to say, well, look, these people, we need to acknowledge what they've been through, that their challenges are different? Yeah, look, I think the challenge in New Zealand is that we get a choice as to how we want the political discourse to be in this country. And and I got to live in America for eight years and I watched it over that period of time as people went to the corners, you know, and either you're a Republican or a Democrat and you believe this about, about that. Uh, and as a result, they looked at each other through stereotypes and through labels, frankly. Mm. And as a result, it's very, very difficult to actually zip that back up together again when you've got that level of polarisation. And my mum was great, and she always used to say to me as a little boy, you know, walk across the room and go talk to someone different from you, you know, and understand what it's like in their shoes. And I think that's what we need. We can have robust, and we should have and must have robust political debate, but actually the personalisation of that is something that we can avoid in New Zealand if we choose to avoid it. And it's about us consciously choosing between the stimulus and response. We've got a moment to choose how we are going to respond to that. Mm. Uh, And that creates discipline, but it also is important because civility in our politics kind of matters. In the US, you know, the, the, the congressmen and the senators all come in from different cities. They say they stay very segregated from each other. Uh, in New Zealand, we run into each other. We may disagree strongly on the political principles uh, in the debate, but actually it doesn't have to be personalised. And mm. I think we need to work hard at that. We need to model that civility in our politics out. Um, and we need to model it actually at our homes and, and our families and, and other places as well. And it's important to you know, have a robust debate by all means, 
but just don't need to make it personal. Yeah, do you feel like we maybe have imported some of that um, understanding in a, from a media landscape into New Zealand as well? Like, and this is you know purely my anecdotal take on this one, but that sometimes yeah, I think to- possibly. But I, I just say that I do honestly think we have a choice as to how we respond to stuff and. Mm. In New Zealand, I think let's not, let's not go sleepwalking into the pathway that other Western democracies have gone down, which is increasing levels of polarization mm. and inability to actually have a proper political debate and discussion because people are so entrenched and vapor locked into their positions that they're not prepared to step out of their world to go find out, well, what, why is someone thinking so differently from me and actually engage and be curious about that. Mm. It's very easy, right? Everyone gets into their echo chambers. They listen to people who are the same world from them that are in the same circles, um, they listen to the same media, consume the same media, um, have the same sort of views and actually don't look to be challenged or provoked with something different. And I think um, I think that's important. Mm. So then last question for me then on the economic side of things too, is that, um, you know, there is, you know, some point that I think might be legitimate in that, you know, when you're trying to say, I want to, you know, rebuild the economy or fix the economy, there are a lot of things that are massively outside of, of your control out of any government's control. And we look at what has happened around the country as well, uh, around the world rather, even things like fuel costs or whatever yeah. too. Those aren't things that, you know, when you say, I want to rebuild the economy and fix that sort of thing, cost of living, you can't really wave a wand and be like, cool, now petrol's back to two bucks a litre and, uh, yeah. you know, eggs are $6 for a dozen. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what, which battles do you pick there? Like when you say specifically reducing cost of living, what can you take direct responsibility for that would help New Zealanders? Yeah, look, I mean, there's no doubt about it. There are international factors, but uh, the Treasury says that we're one of the few countries in the world that's less impacted by those. You know, if you're living in the UK at the moment, you're deeply impacted by Ukraine and mm. heating costs and oil costs and all those things. Our problem in New Zealand is that our inflation has been domestically created. It's not been internationally imported. So yes, there's rising fuel prices. Yes, there was COVID. Yes, there's a war in Ukraine. Yes, there's some element of that that impacts our, our position. But actually, the vast majority of it, frankly, is what's, is what's called domestic inflation. And that has happened because this government was the second biggest spender of government spending per capita in the world. I think we were the fourth biggest printers of cash per capita in the world. And we shut the country down like no other. And as a result, all of that pressure spiked asset prices. It led to inflation. When you get inflation, you've only got one thing to do, which is raise interest rates to try and suppress it. When interest rates go up, the risk is you stall the economy and put it into recession, which has now happened. And then when economies in recession and businesses are laying off workers, uh, and that leads to rising unemployment. And when people lose a job and can't buy food, or pay their rent, uh, that's a different level of pain again. Mm. So what you've got to do is get, you can do all this band-aid economics over the top or otherwise you get to the causes of it. And for us it is, you know, stop passing costs on to businesses that lead to higher prices, free up the immigration settings and also the red tape so that people can actually grow companies and businesses and keep people employed. Go through the $137 billion of government spending. It's not the government's money, it's taxpayers' money. Make mm. sure they're getting value for it. Give people tax relief because they'll spend it and save it better than the government and Chris Hipkins will. And then ultimately get the Reserve Bank uh, getting inflation back under 3%. And that's the lessons of history over the last 50 years that we have to relearn again. Mm. Well, one of the lessons of history too with government spending is it is notoriously hard to ever go down from one year to the next, right? <laughs> like if you ever look through, I think it is the, um, you know, even say last 100 years or so to find a government that's managed to say, okay, guys, before I spent this, we have now spent less. I don't think it's ever been done. Yeah, Bill English did a very good job where he actually got, I mean, I think that the, the thing I'd say is that uh, what amazes me coming from the outside world is it's only in politics that governments measure their success by how much money they're spending right. rather than the results that they're achieving. Mm -hmm. So how do you spend $5 billion more on education, hire 1,400 more bureaucrats, and yet our attendance records are worse for kids going to school. 40% of our kids don't go to school regularly. Mm. Now we have half our 15-year-olds failing the most basic, basic mass reading and writing tests, so our academic achievement's bad. So how do you spend more, hire more, and get worse outcomes? And that's a particular skill set of this government. But I do believe that it's actually got to be about outcomes. Mm. We're going to spend more money each and every year on health and education. You know, that's really critical for us to make sure we've got good levels of investment going in. But the bigger issue is how do you get performance and how do you get outcomes? Because it's actually when your kids can actually read and write that actually gives them opportunities to take on jobs that actually could be higher paying, that sets them up for a future. That's important. 
um, when you actually focus on delivering, you know, lowering wait times for hospitals and uh, access to specialists and surgeries, you know, that's the stuff that makes a difference out there for people's lives. When you actually focus on reducing crime mm. rather than just reducing the prison population, that's the way in which you actually get outcomes that improve people's daily lives. Well, and that does lead into, yeah, talking about the law and order side of things too, number two in the, in the big three yeah. uh, for National this year. And um, I mean, as you mentioned there, when it comes to economic outcomes, often, you know, there is a correlation between yeah. crime and economic and uh, and how people are feeling there. So so talk to us about that. I mean the 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 high level is restoring law and order. What does that mean? Yeah. Well, there's two ways. There's two things we have to do at the same time. One is we actually have to do what Bill English called social investment, and I'm a big fan of it. I've seen it work in bits of the US, uh, where we basically use data to identify families and individuals that are going to uh, you know are on a trajectory that just we know isn't good for them. Yeah. And so actually, how do we make powerful targeted interventions using the data to actually support those families and to actually lift them up? Uh, and to raise them up, uh, and that's really what we've got to do. Um, and and you well, can what are some of those things look well, like? Well, you can see interactions. You know, the social determinants really of of what causes crime, for example. You know, it's poverty, it's housing insecurity, it's health issues, it's education issues. So where we see those interactions with the with the with the criminal justice system, or you know, we've got to be able to get social workers and community organisations, in particular, I believe, uh, into doing that work um, and getting alongside those individuals and families. And if you can. Yeah, we know if we can keep a kid in school, they get a chance to actually get a job. Uh, that is a much better life than letting them go on to welfare before the age mm. of 25. If they're on welfare before then, they're on average for the next 15 years. Over that 15 years, you're paying $20,000 probably just in benefits, let alone actually all the admin associated with that. So why wouldn't we take some of that value, that money we're going to spend in the future, because we know where that's going to go, mm. and take some of that money and surge it and pull it forward so we can actually change the trajectory of where those lives are going. So, are there some programs though that we've seen successfully? The the, the benefit the trap is a well you know well established kind of There's thing. Some right? Great so, yeah. programs, great so, programs. I see it all the time, um, and so and I'm out with them typically yep. most weeks. But what I really want to do, one of my great heroes was a guy called Viktor Frankl, and he was mm. one of the great Holocaust survivors and psychiatrists in the world. But he wrote a good book called Man's Search for Meaning, and in Love that, that book, book is yeah the three actors in society being government, business, and community. And I think what's happened is we've gone into a very parent-child relationship where the government dominates everything mm. and doesn't actually partner or work well with the business or the community sector. And yet, if you think about it, government sets up the rules and the frameworks and, and enables things to happen. Businesses can move with great speed and scale. And community organisations, of which there's some fantastic ones across New Zealand doing amazing work, getting great outcomes, see the pain, the hurt, the need, the frustration. So why aren't we taking the money out of the centre of Wellington and giving it to the community organisations and powering them up given they get better results? A good example for me was mental health. You know, like, um, you know, we sided with the government to say, look, we will support the $1.9 billion investment in mental health. And it was found out later that it didn't really go anywhere. It didn't lead to any mm. improved access and, and support and services. And yet Mike King with Gumboot Friday is doing amazing work and there's many other organisations too. Uh, in that space. And so, you know, why don't we just double up the amount of money we give Mike, which is what I've committed to do, uh, because he's getting good outcomes. And mm -hmm. every dollar you give him, he generates something like $8.30 in social benefit of costs that we're not incurring across the criminal justice, health, education system anyway. Um, so I think we have to think really differently about scaling and powering up community organisations that are doing great work and getting great results. Yeah, um, there's that thought of, uh, well, maybe ambulance at the top of the cliff, maybe the police car at the top or the bottom of the cliff is the right way to talk about this one. When you're looking at different criminal activities that are happening in New Zealand, there's that sense of, you know, how do we prevent things, which it sounds like, you yeah, know, Yeah, so there's very, two bits. There's sort of like yeah. tough on the causes of crime, yeah. for want of a better way of saying a bit, bit of a cliche, and yeah. then tough on crime. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's the other part is that the, the reality is we're not calling people to rights and responsibilities, and we need to be able to do that. Um, you know, you've got certain rights as a Kiwi, but you've also got certain responsibilities to each other and to the country. And at the moment, sadly, the government has sent from the top a very soft on crime sort of message. And it's sort of said to, you know, that you can kind of get away with it. And that's because it's had one goal only, a 30% reduction in the prison population. We would all want to see that. But actually that would come when you have a 30% reduction in crime. And you know, go meet with retail retailers who are doing it incredibly tough. And I think of a number of you know heartbreaking stories there of people who have worked incredibly hard to be ram raided and, mm. and have their business and their livelihoods destroyed, and their and their and their the trauma and the anxiety that comes with all of that. Um, we've got major increases in violent crime. We now have had a seventy percent growth in gang membership. There's now nine gang members for every ten police officers. 
we have a ram raid in this country every 11 hours. So we, we get to choose because otherwise what happens is every six months it gets more frequent, it gets more gratuitous and it gets more violent. And so we, we have to say, look, enough is enough. We actually do need to be able to work on the causes and determinants of what's driving the crime. But you can't just do that alone. It's an and, not mm. an or. And you also have to call people to responsibility. And therefore, that's why we say we're going to back the police, tackle the gangs, serious consequences for serious young offenders and stronger sentencing. Mm. So let's then talk about schools and, and healthcare then. I mean, we've kind of, as I'm sure people have noticed, these things interweave just yeah, a little bit. Yeah, they do. Bit. They're all linked. What do you feel like is missing then from our, our approach to schooling right now? Uh, and, and what's creating these outcomes where, as you say, uh, what is it up to 40% of- Yeah, not in school. Not in school regularly. What is, yeah. So what does that actually mean when you're saying that when they're not in school regularly? What's the metric for that? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess I, I come at the education thing. It's quite personal for me because, you know, I grew up with a great mum and dad, but they'd left school at 15 and 16. Sure. And I was the first in, of the three boys to ever go to university in my family. And um, I've just felt that education got me from a set of circumstances to an even better set of circumstances, really. And that's actually what we want it to be about. We're a party that doesn't believe in an equality of outcome, that we should all be treated the same. That's called socialism. We just don't buy that. But we do buy deeply that we are believe in an equality of opportunity. You know, that if you're a five-year-old sitting off in New Zealand, irrespective of your family, your neighbourhood, your community, that you deserve a shot at your version of the Kiwi dream, whatever that may need to be. And how do we get you to the start line so that you can actually, you know, have that, have that opportunity? And I think that's where education comes in. You know, you really want to make sure education is one of those things, as I said, that gets you from a set of circumstances to a better set. So for me, yeah, where are we at today? Well, we have 40% of our kids not at school regularly, which means they're not at school, you know, nine days out of 10 or more. We've got 75,000 kids, sadly, chronically absent from school, which I think is over, you know, at seven days or less at school. Uh, and you seven got days at less, what, per... Uh, out of out of seven days out of out of ten. Oh right, okay, yep, yeah. And so you know, essentially, when you and when you think about that, everyone goes, "Oh, that doesn't sound like a lot." Well, actually, it all adds up, and so you end up losing a year of schooling over thirteen years if that's your regular attendance rate. Right, and that's a big problem. Um, so we've got major challenges on attendance, but part of that is really linked to academic achievement. And so half our kids now arrive at third form or year nine at high school, not actually at the standard they need to be at to take on high school. And so if you're 13 and you read like a nine-year-old, it's no wonder you don't bother going to school anymore or get disengaged from school pretty quickly. Um, and then we did a test. There's a regular test that's on at 15. And, you know, this year half our 15-year-olds failed the most basic, and I mean basic maths, reading and writing test. And most alarmingly, in our really challenged schools, our decile one schools, you know, 98% of our kids failed the writing test, 90% failed the reading test. Mm. So, you know, how on earth are we supposed to get, um, it's a social challenge and a social problem, it's also a big economic problem because how on earth do we access higher paying jobs if we're not educating the next generation better than the one that went before it? Mm. So you have those challenges and when I came through, we were in the top 10 countries in the world on maths, reading and science and we're well out of the top 10 countries now. So. Surely our goal has to be, let's get 80% of our kids sorted by 2030 so they're ready to go for high school. Let's make sure that we're actually back in the top 10 by 2033. Mm. How do we do it? We have to go back and teach an hour of maths, an hour of reading and writing each and every day in primary and intermediate. Yes, we have to have a really well-defined curriculum because um, our curriculums are too loose and too high and over three years, not, not individual years and be clear about it's teacher instructed about we're teaching these concepts at this time this year uh, to these kids. Uh, we've got to have regular monitoring and assessment every six months to make sure our kids aren't getting left behind and we can identify dyslexia earlier and make the interventions we need. And we need to support the teachers who are doing a great job, but actually the system's letting them down. Um, and that means giving them some tools and technologies that can help them be more efficient with their time uh, so they can actually teach. Do you feel like you've got the buy-in as well from the uh, the teacher organisations as well? Because there seems to sometimes be a little pushback when, I mean, to be honest, it may not be limited just to uh, to your party, but in general, when a new education policy is submitted, then, you know, different teachers unions or organizations will come back and say, oh, that's a terrible idea because blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But ultimately, you'll need these people on board to make this plan happen, right? Yeah. So how do you how do you change that? Well, I think, you know, we've, we, this isn't just us making it up on the fly. This has been a lot of work from Erica Stanford and myself just actually talking to experts, meeting with teachers, meeting with principals meeting with educators, seeing what's worked in other jurisdictions around the world where they had falling standards and they managed to turn it around and how did they do it. And so we know that there is some really common evidence-based uh, stuff in education that we really need to make sure that we, we are really following 
versus just what's the current sort of philosophy at the moment that mm. sort of is a bit of a vibe rather than actually something that's really very specific and, and evidence-based. So, yeah, look, I mean, I think we've we've put together a really good program. Uh, there's always more to do, um, but at the moment, what's the key thing? Teach our kids the basics so that they get a shot on uh, to be able to do the, the more extended learning later. Okay. So, look, a couple of quicker ones in, yeah. um, in, the, in the time that we've got left, um, and this might be hard to answer quickly, but we've no, had no. a few of our listeners ask particularly, do, do you think we have a problem with free speech in New Zealand? Yeah, look, I mean, I think I'll, I'll always defend people's ability, uh, you know, for free speech, and I may not like what you say, but I have to defend your ability to say it, uh, and I think that's important. Mm. Um, would you change anything about the current abortion laws? Uh, no, I've made a commitment that actually we opened that conversation up uh, before I came to Parliament. I personally am, am pro-life, but um, that's, you know, we've opened those up, we've litigated that conversation, and they won't be changing in my government. Mm. Um, how would you stop talent from leaving New Zealand? It's really about making sure we get an economy where people feel that they can work and actually get ahead, make sure that they actually can feel safe in their homes, their businesses and communities by getting on top of that law and order, and also making sure they've got a future where they actually believe they can access healthcare when it's needed, and also their kids are going to be set up for a future and so it is the combination of all of those things that makes the proposition such that people feel if I work hard in the best country on earth, I can get ahead and do well. I can start a business. I can raise my family. I can make a contribution to the community. And so, you know, and at the moment, you know, 34,000 Kiwis left in the last year because mm. they don't feel that. And that's my job as Prime Minister is to build that proposition back strongly. Okay. You can take a little bit more time with this one if you like. But yeah. um, as we are obviously a, a Christian radio station, it's very important to our listeners. I'd just yeah. love to know, just based on your understanding, uh, why, why should a Christian vote for the National Party? Well, actually, I don't, I mean, this is really interesting. I spoke about this in my maiden speech and I encourage anyone to read it. But um because you know my Christian faith is really important to me. It's given me huge uh, grounding and centrality and a set of values about how I teach, how I, how I interact with people. It's how my parents raised us and in, in our faith uh, experience as well. And my faith heroes are people like the William Wilberforces and Kate Shepherds and Martin Luther Kings who actually chose to get involved in the world uh, and actually work it out and actually treat people in the right way. But I also have a belief that you shouldn't vote for me just because I'm a Christian. Uh, and actually, as a Christian, I shouldn't be proselytizing my views that I'm here to represent all New Zealanders as well. And I think, you know, it's a very dangerous position if you start advocating for one interest group over another group, you know, or one faith over another faith. So, yes, my faith is a Christian faith. Yes, it's personal to me. Um, but it means that I am actually here to represent all New Zealanders. Uh, and... Um, and if you think you want to vote for me because I'm a Christian, um, you know, I just say to you, yeah. And if you and you think that I'm I'm not putting my Christian views out to the rest of New Zealand and expecting them to do that either, I think that's the deal uh, when you come into public life. Mm -hmm. I'm here to represent everybody uh, and do my best to do that. So from my point of view, you know, it's very simple. You know, I think if you've got a, a very stark choice, you know, a coalition of chaos with more of the same this year. Uh, from the other side, or you get a strong, stable, national-led government that's going to be getting our ambition and some aspiration back into the joint, some more mojo and positivity and confidence, you know, which is what I think the country's missing at the moment. You know, mm. I think we're playing a very negative, inward game at the moment. You know, we have so much opportunity in the best country on earth. Uh, we have endless potential, amazing people, great part of the world to be part of, good liberal democracy and institutions, no excuses for why we can't do well. Mm. But at the moment, we're not realizing that opportunity. Uh, we're not really solving the problems. We're not maximizing uh, opportunities that we have in front of us. So that's the work that I want to get involved with. Okay. So uh, you get the um, first yeah. person's privilege on this uh, this last question <laughs> that I have for you today too, because uh, of course we have other leaders coming through over the course of uh, this week. Yep. And so this last thing is something I like to call pass it on, yep. uh, because our next political leader coming in is going to be Winston Peters. Oh, right. And so your opportunity is to pass on a question to him. So um, what would be your question to Winston <laughs> Peters? Well, I mean, I'd just say to him, um, you know, I, I just want to know what his plans are for the country, really, and how he's going to take it forward and, and keep the country united, you know, because um, I think that, you know, people want us to make life a little less expensive, a lot more convenient, and a lot more united. And um, I'd be interested in asking him the question, how is he planning to make New Zealand more united? I will absolutely put that to him then. Chris Luxon, thank you so much again for coming in. Leader of the National Party, possibly future <laughs> Prime Minister of New Zealand. We'll have to wait and see. Appreciate it. Good to be with you. Thanks for your time.